Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 1st of December. And a quick look at the week ahead beginning the 4th of December. Now, it's, it's been a while since I've um, done one of these. Um, my absence has been for family reasons, which I won't go into here. But certainly we've seen a significant move higher in equity markets. And we've also seen a significant reduction in bond yields and a sell-off in the dollar. So essentially, what does that mean? Well, in the past couple of weeks, we've seen markets undergo a significant shift in when they think or how long they can think central banks can keep rates at current levels. Just before my, my two week absence, the narrative was very much higher for longer with the prospect of rate cuts much before 2025. Um, pretty much not not really up for discussion. I think you could probably make a case for the fact that we might see rate cuts at the end of 2024, but certainly I think the expectation was that um, we wouldn't see them much before that. So what's changed? Well, quite simply, it's the market perceptions of inflation. And the recent inflation numbers from not only the US, but also Europe, China as well, obviously, is in deflation or disinflation, has really shifted the dial. Um, and consequently, um, markets are now much more confident that central banks will be forced to cut rates, potentially as early as the middle of next, next year, or even sooner. And not for good reasons either. And I think that is really where I think um, there is some uncertainty as to whether or not central banks being forced to cut rates is actually a good thing um, because they are responding to a significant economic slowdown. Nonetheless, we've seen big rises in equity markets over the course of the past couple of weeks. Well, some equity markets anyway. FTSE 100 has been really underwhelming. Um, and I think these concerns about the economic outlook have really manifested themselves in the oil price um, and the decline in Brent crude prices, despite the events in the Middle East, um, close to the lows of the last um, few months. And, and obviously that has affected um, the FTSE 100, given the fact that it has a high, a high number of commodity stocks in it because obviously if you get if you've got a weak economic recovery then obviously demand for um, basic resources starts to diminish that said um, we are still we're still edging higher on the FTSE 100 currently testing resistance at around about 7500 here this previous peak back in the middle of November we're struggling to get much above that more importantly I think we're also very much in the downtrend that we've been in since we posted those record highs back in February this year. So I think if we are going to get excited about a rebound in stock markets, then what I really want to see is a breakout of the move higher that we've, uh, from the downtrend in the FTSE 100. We've seen the DAX go um, from strength to strength. That has really outperformed a bit like the S&P 500. But significantly, despite the fact that we've rallied strongly from our October lows, I mean, that is a sizable move higher um, over the course of the last few weeks. And it's been largely driven by an expectation, perhaps, that we are starting to see a bottoming out in manufacturing activity in the euro area, um, albeit from very, very low levels. But also, I think, that for all the ECBs, the European Central Bank's protestations that rates need to be higher for longer, no one's buying it. And to be quite honest, I'm not buying it. Um, you know, we've certainly seen um, the fact that rates, bond yields in particular, have seen a significant decline over the course of the past few weeks. We can see it here in the UK. We can see it in the US. We can see it, more importantly, um, in Europe as well. And if we look at the Germany two-year index, 
which I've got here, we can see that German two-year yields are at their lowest levels since June. So pretty much closing in on six-month lows, which suggests that the market is now looking to price in rate cuts from the ECB as soon as April next year. I certainly would buy into that unless we start to see evidence that inflation is starting to bottom out. But given the fact that German inflation has fallen really sharply since August, and EU inflation, EU CPI is now at 2.4%, well, we're pretty much back to the ECB's inflation target. And given the lagging effects of monetary policy, you could reasonably argue that an awful lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to rate hikes actually hasn't completely filtered down into the European economy, the UK economy, or the US economy. So as we look ahead to December and the end of the year, the big week is the week just before Christmas. It's the, when we have the meetings from the Federal Reserve, the ECB, and the Bank of England. Now, obviously not expecting any change in policy, but I think one thing that these central bankers will want to do is they won't want to open the door fully to the idea that they are now starting to look at cutting rates anytime soon. They've done the heavy lifting. In fact, you could argue that they've probably gone too far when it comes to rate hikes. They've done the heavy lifting. They don't want to start cutting rates until they're absolutely sure, absolutely certain that they've slain the, in, the inflation genie. And, you know, people are talking about deflation. I don't think we're there yet, but that's not to say that we might not get there just on the basis of the fact that economic activity basically falls off a cliff. We look at the two year yield in the US, we look at the 10 year yield in the US, we've seen significant technical breaks lower in all of the, all of the, all of the, all of these charts here. We saw that back earlier this month in November when we broke below those lows back in October at around about three, at around about 450 on the um, 10 year. We've now broken below that, around about 4.3%. If we stay below, any, and if we get any rebound back to 4.5, and we could well do, because I think that you will start to see some pushback on the behalf, on the part of some Fed officials of this narrative that, that, that rate cuts are coming, because I think the last thing they want to do is loosen financial conditions to the point whereby inflation starts to find a little bit of a base just above that 2% area. Um, yeah, we have seen a slowdown, but an awful lot of the effects that we that we saw from the high inflation of last year will now start to drop out of the numbers and inflation will start to stabilize in and around the current levels in the US of around about 3%. And they'll want to make sure that that final move between 3.5, which is where the PCE is now, and 2% continues to drift lower. They won't want to see a significant pickup. So we could get a pullback in 10 year yields back to 4.5 and that could well be dollar positive in the short to medium term which could then mean that we start to get a little bit of a stabilization after the big moves that we've seen in November and we have seen some big moves in November we've seen very big moves particularly in equity markets but also in the dollar and also in bond yields so we look at the DAX um, if we do get further upside It'll be interesting to see whether or not we, we take out those previous peaks back here, the record highs back in August. So that's where I've got my particular eye on. If we also look at, say, for example, the S&P 500, we are back above 4,500. But I think it's also important to note that even though we are starting to re-approach these highs back from March 2022, in the last two years, to all intents and purposes, we've gone nowhere. We've just wiped out the losses from 2022 um, and clawed them back to back to where we were at the beginning of 2022. 
So to all intents and purposes, US markets haven't really gone anywhere. If you look at it through the prism of the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100 or the Dow, obviously we've broken higher on the NASDAQ and get rid of that. This is another weekly chart. It's over four years trading above the previous July peaks. But again, as with the S&P, we're back at the levels that we were at the beginning of 2022. If you actually look at the Russell 2000, the picture is completely different, which is obviously a much better barometer of the US economy. And look where we are there. So even though the S&P, the Dow and the NASDAQ are all back close to the levels in 2022, around here, the Russell 2000 is not. And that's not to say that we can't recover back to the peaks that we saw um, earlier this year, but certainly there is something not quite right about what's going on with respect to the US economy. And I think that is being reflected in how the Russell 2000 has performed and is performing. So what does that mean for the dollar going forward? Well, obviously, we saw a very big rebound in the dollar in November. Uh, so, sorry, a big, yeah, we, we saw a little bit of a, um, a sell off in the dollar in November. What am I talking about? And in the past couple of days, we've seen that start to pull back a little bit. Uh, certainly, if you look at these daily charts, you could argue that we've seen a short term top in euro dollar and we could start to drift back down and we could start to see a resumption or a consolidation um, of the recent dollar move that we saw to the downside. Dolly yen's obviously got a bit weaker as well, but certainly I think if we look at euro dollar on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, we may well um, struggle to make further gains. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Obviously, you've got the fact that um, Powell and a number of Fed officials will push back on the narrative of rate cuts. But for me, it's not about whether or not we get rate cuts next year. I think we will. It's, in, it's the question of who starts the rate cut process. Now, an awful lot of people have suggested it might be the Federal Reserve. I struggle with that. I struggle with that because the US economy is in a much better place than the economy in Europe, the economy here in the UK. And ultimately, central banks generally tend to respond to economic weakness. And if you're working on that basis, then the ECB is probably the safest bet when it comes to rate cuts. Now, I, I fully expect, I would expect the ECB to start cutting first. Yes, there are a number of hawkish members um, on the governing council, um, but they only make up around about three or four um, central banks, obviously Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany. Um, but for all of that, when you look at the inflation numbers, you know, inflation is slowing very sharply. Italy is in deflation now on headline CPI, disinflation. And PPI has been in pretty much deflation for most of this year. And that generally tends to be a leading indicator. Now, you might argue that we might start to see a pick up, inflation, pick up in inflation at the start of the year. And certainly, I think that is a valid concern. Inflation generally doesn't slow in a straight line. It um, ratchets up and down. We've certainly seen that in the US in the summer um, where we bottomed out at 3% on CPI and then we edged higher uh, and we edged higher to 3.7%, but we have now since started to drift lower again. So looking at this chart, you could argue that we could see a little bit of a pullback in Euro dollar to around about the 50 day or 200 day moving average to around about 107.40, 107.50. Certainly, you've got the evidence there that there is a little bit of a pullback. And ultimately, if you think that the ECB is going to be cutting first in response to economic weakness, that's not going to be positive for the euro. Um, that's no better played out than in what euro sterling has been doing these past few days and weeks. Um, 20th of November, we squeezed all the way up to 87.70. Since then, we've dropped below. 86.50. We're now heading towards 86 and could well head back towards these lows here. But 
ultimately, Euro Sterling is a range trade, has been all year, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Also, the Bank of England is probably going to be the central bank least likely to encourage the idea of a rate cut on the basis that headline CPI here in the UK is that much higher. Also, we're still trending wage growth at 7.9%, um, and services inflation is at 6.6%. So um, I, I can certainly see the Bank of England pushing back on the narrative of rate cuts in the first half of next year. Whether or not, of course, we get them is another matter. But certainly on the basis of who I think will be cutting rates first, I think it will be ECB, followed potentially by the Bank of England, and last but not least by the Federal Reserve, though you could probably interchange the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. But I certainly think based on the data, the ECB will probably be forced into cutting rates first. Looking at cable, seeing a bit of a reversal there, fairly decent support of 125.90. What was particularly interesting about this particular move here was the highs in 2023 to the lows in October, we got a perfect 61.8 Fibonacci retracement of that entire down move from 131.40 to 120.35. We've seen a nice pullback off that 127.20 area. We've seen a fairly decent reversal here, which might suggest that we could see um, a correction back towards 124.5. But while we're above 125.90, um, then we could see a retest of that 127.20 area. But certainly I think at these sorts of levels, we may be due a little bit of a pullback towards 124.60 while below this 127.20 area here. And we're certainly looking over bought on the slow stochastic. Dollar yen, similar sort of story. We found a little bit of a base around about 147, 146.80 seen a bit of a rebound back into the cloud. But again, here with the 50 day moving average, that acted as a fairly decent barrier around about 149.70, 149.80. And as long as that caps along with the cloud resistance, we could start to see the dollar drift lower over the course of the next few days and weeks as we head into year end. But I think while we're below 150, um, we could drift back um, to 147, but we'll probably, we could go back to 150 first before we start to drift lower again. We could see a little bit of dollar strength in the short to medium term before we start to resume the downtrend that we've seen in the past few days. Let's have a quick look at Brent. If like me, you noticed that petrol pump prices have become cheaper over the course of the past few days and weeks. Well, you're not wrong, and this is why. If we look at October the 7th, which is basically when um, uh, Hamas um, did that, 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 that awful terrorist attack on Israel. Saw a big move higher in oil prices. But since then, we've come all the way back down, making new lows back here at around about $77 a barrel. And at the moment, we're currently capped at $84.5 a barrel. Why? Well, because it's a fairly decent area of support through there resistance through there and resistance through there. So I think as long as oil prices stay in and around these current levels, then hopefully those prices at the pump will continue to come down. Certainly, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on that over the course of the next few days. Gold has taken an absolute surge higher, back towards the peaks of earlier this year, around about 2070, 2080. I think that's the next key barrier. Much will depend on yields in that regard. We've seen a significant slide in yields since the beginning of October, and we've seen a significant rally higher in gold prices along the, alongside the weaker dollar. This area here will be a big barrier. And I think it will be, I'll be surprised if we break it this year. We can certainly see that based on this series of highs through a year. It's a big, big barrier. If we can get above it, then we could well kick on. But for the time being, I would probably expect that to hold in the short to medium term. So as we head into December, um, not much in the way 
of earnings announcements, but we do have non-farm payrolls to look forward to, US payrolls. Last month's October jobs report was the first one this year when the headline number came in below market expectations, though it's certainly not by enough to raise concerns over the resilience of the US economy. The US still remains very much um, the best performing economy in the G8. Um, unlike September, when US jobs surged by 297,000, jobs growth slowed in October to 150,000, while the unemployment rate ticked higher to 3.9%. Um, now, obviously, that's a good thing because what the Federal Reserve will want to see is unemployment edging a little bit higher. We also saw a similarly weak ADP payrolls report as well. So certainly the number of job gains um, is slowing. We saw a softer ISM services survey as well. And we've seen, obviously, yields come off quite considerably since that last payrolls report. And as I said previously, this is the next challenge for the US Central Bank, who will be keen to at least give the impression that they're not going to be bullied by the markets into um, dropping their higher for longer rates mantra. It's also, it's also worth noting that the jobs, the jolts job openings are still elevated at levels of nine and a half million. And weekly jobless claims are continuing to trend at around about 210,000. Though the last claims numbers did see continuing claims jump quite sharply to 1.95 million up from 1.87 million. So there's a big jump there. Expectations are for 100, around about 160, 170,000 jobs to be added in November. However, you do need to remember that after the Thanksgiving weekend, generally um, US retailers do an awful lot of seasonal hiring, um, which could boost the numbers. Also, the auto workers strikers have also the auto the auto workers strikes have come to an end. So you could start to see those numbers get added back in to the payrolls numbers. So I think if we are going to see any evidence of cracking in the US economy, we're not going to see it in the November payrolls report. So I would expect to see a fairly strong number, as I said previously, the um, estimates for November payrolls were for a number in the region of around about 163,000, though that could well be revised up. And the latest revision now is 200. So again, when I when I originally wrote this little piece of a narrative, it was about a week or so ago, and the estimates have gone up from 163 to 200. So make of that what you may, and also wage growth is still trending at around about 4%. So I would expect next week's payrolls report, this coming week's payrolls report, um, to reinforce the narrative of a fairly resilient US economy. We've also got services PMIs um, for November. We have started to see some improvement in manufacturing, but the manufacturing numbers still remain pretty poor. French economy fell, fell into contraction in Q3. Obviously, weaker inflation numbers point to um, falling prices as well, particularly when we see at the manufacturing level. The big question, I think, going forward is whether or not we're starting to see a slowdown in prices in the services sector. And at the moment, we don't appear to be seeing that to the same extent. Services inflation does appear to be a worry for the ECB. We've also got the RBA, um, who are due to meet. Um, later this week, not really expecting anything surprising from them. Back in November, the RBA took the decision to diverge from its recent peers and hike rates again by 25 basis points to 4.35% after five months of keeping them at 4 and 4.1. Now, you could argue this is an admission of failure, that their um, decision to keep rates on hold at 4.1% was a mistake. And I would certainly argue, I, ca I certainly can't see the rationale for the RBA to hike rates, but they have, they did. The big question now is whether or not um, they will be forced to cut them again um, sooner rather than later. I can't see much in the way of upside um, for the Aussie dollar at this point in time. If we look at the peaks of the last few weeks, months rather, uh, there's a big, big top at uh, 
Um, this 68.90 area, we'll be, I think we'll be lucky to get back there. There's a certainly resistance at the highs this week of around about 66.80. So we really, I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not um, they are hawkish or they continue to be hawkish in the same way that the RBNZ was earlier this week when they actually adjusted higher their expectations for their terminal rate, which prompted a spike in the Kiwi. We've also got China trade numbers for November. Um, we've got the Bank of Canada rate decision as well, which could well be a fairly decent indicator for the Federal Reserve a week after that. Um, on full-time employment, um, we haven't really seen any growth in the, in the Canadian economy at all in the last three months. So I can't see that there'll be any indication that they're going to be moving on the rate front there. In full-time employment, we saw the first decline in jobs growth since May in the October jobs report, um, a decline of 3.3%, even though there was a rise of 17.5% between full and part-time. All of the growth came in part-time positions and inflationary pressure is starting to subside in Canada as well. So again, I think we're looking at status quo very much on rates for pretty much all of this month. On the earnings front, we've got, um, we're coming into the dying embers of the earnings season. We've got Fraser's Group, owners of Sports Direct, their first half numbers on the 7th of December. And we've also got GameStop on the 6th of December. And we've seen some really strong moves higher in GameStop shares on the back of some options buying where traders have been hoovering up $20 calls ahead of this upcoming Q3 earnings announcement for GameStop. So obviously, I think there's an expectation perhaps that we could get a decent set of earnings numbers from GameStop. We will see. Sounds a bit like a fool's errand to me, but who knows um, in these markets these days. Anyway, thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all have a great weekend. And if you want to listen in to the last, the last non-farm payrolls this year on the 8th of December, I'll be starting um, the uh, presentation at around about 1 p.m., covering the numbers live at 1.30 p.m. You can sign up for it um, on the in on the news page underneath webinars and events if you so choose. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great weekend and speak to you all next week.